and welcome to Matt Forrest, which, who's a good friend of mine and uh, ex uh, Mosulani student and Baha TA. <laughs> and, um, and Matt just recently um, uh, obtained his PhD at Scripps, in, actually recently, 2013, I thought it was last year. Right? Yeah. No. Yeah, okay. Well, kind of recently, um, he received his PhD at uh, in, um, in San Diego on a dissertation on ecological and geochemical aspects of terrestrial hydrothermal systems. So that's what we're going to be hearing today a lot about, uh, hydrothermal systems. And in 2004, uh, received his master's degree here at Moss Landing on a thesis on the geology and geochemistry and ecology of shallow water submarine hydrothermal vent in Bahia Concepcion, Baja California, Sur, Mexico. And a few years before, he got, got his BAs in marine biology and English literature, which is the first time I discovered that, so his but background. Know. But, you know, he wrote something about himself which I want to read because it's quite entertaining. I didn't um, write that. Oh, you didn't write that? Okay. So, Matt, check this out, is an ecologist and fluid chemist who specializes in biogeochemical studies. His, his work spans the marine and terrestrial realms, so basically besides, you know, the other planets everywhere, and he seeks to understand the complex interactions between geology, ecology, and geochemistry. So really, he covers a lot of different fields, and he does it very successfully. He is multi-talented. He just started a new direction working with the terrestrial LIDAR in the last few months. So uh, you'll see how his uh, presentation today and the work he's been doing is really multidisciplinary. So it's going to be really exciting. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, I have to say, uh, um, like Mike, I have a master's from Moss Landing and a PhD from Scripps, and let's just leave it at you guys are very lucky. This is a great place, and I'm going to really talk about some of the great things that Moss Landing has to offer today. Um, you know, you're right next to Ambari, you're right near UC Santa Cruz. Probably the, the overall message I want to give today, and, and Ivano sort of alluded to it, is you know, serendipity is a great thing, and if you're going out in the field and you're with experts in different fields, Keep your eyes and your ears open because you never know what you might come across that could be your next subject that you deal with in science. So this was uh, the title of my PhD uh, defense dissertation at Scripps. And what I'm going to talk about today is going to be a mashup, really, of uh, Moss Landing stuff and SIO stuff. So when I started at Moss Landing, I was, I was working under Mike Foster. And uh, he wanted me to go to Baja, really, is all he cared about. So it didn't really matter what my thesis was. And I started working on these sea stars that would come creeping out at night from underneath the sediments and go feed and forage, they were crepuscular. So it was either early in the morning or late at night. And I tell you, it was the worst thesis ever because all these guys are sitting around drinking tequila and I'm out diving and, you know. So uh, eventually I stumbled across this hydrothermal vent in, in Bahia Concepcion. Uh, Diana Steller had sort of discovered it for us because uh, there's a rotolith bed right next by it, next to it. And my thesis sort of evolved into a whole di bunch of different things. And the, the only reason that this could have happened is because of the people that I encountered and worked with along the way. So really want to thank everybody here and, and also really emphasize to you all the students here that this is a special place and really make sure that you go out and you make those connections with all these different neighboring institutions because it will really broaden your science. So as you can see, um, the stuff I worked on at Moss was more um, shallow marine vent ecology. I did a lot of stable isotope work. Again, there was a class that was offered at, at Moss Landing that Rob Burton, who's in the audience today, taught as a seminar. And it turned out that because of his connections, we were able to go and collect data and go do stable isotope analyses during this seminar. And that really opened up a whole new world to me in terms of ecological uh, interactions. Talk a lot about that today and stable isotopes in general. Uh, then when I got to SIO, things kind of changed. Um, they didn't really like the idea of me diving in Mexico uh, with my partners. Um, and uh, it was, uh, they decided to kind of shut me down on that aspect. And plus, there were some other aspects I'll tell you about that made it much more amenable for science, for really good statistical analyses to work on these terrestrial systems. <clears throat> and then what we kind of discovered along the way is that some of these terrestrial hydrothermal springs are serving as important refuge for endemic species. And uh, it became a very interesting study. Um, so this was my master's talk. Again, um, I tried to make my titles as boring as possible. And uh, <clears throat> I think uh, I outdid this one with my SIO title as well. So, 
Uh, and the, here was the cast of characters that really helped me out there. I don't see Gary Green here tonight, but um, he's probably drinking tequila on a beach somewhere. And, uh, of course, the illustrious Mike Foster. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing there, but if you notice, he's got a rotolith around his neck, so he's happy. And then uh, Kenneth Cole doing what he loves to do, you know. <laughs> so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is, um, you know, some of you may know about uh, deep sea hydrothermal vents and how important they are. Well, one of the things that happens at these, at these deep sea vents is you have faults or fractures or fissures. And that's allowing the cold seawater to percolate in, then hit a magmatic source, get heated up, interact with the rocks around it, and it changes the composition of the water. So it alters the chemistry due to water-rock interactions. And this is going to be a, a, a theme that you're going to see throughout, even in the terrestrial realm. <clears throat> so the deep sea uh, hydrothermal vents are, were a fascinating discovery. This is where we really first learned that chemosynthesis could drive really productive systems. Some of the people at Scripps were some of the first people to sort of stumble across them. And they described them as oases in the otherwise desert seafloor. Not quite true, but it was a major discovery. And what they found is that these animals, this, uh, this guy here is a tube worm that can be up to a meter long. And this animal derives no nutrition from eating, from feeding in a traditional way. It derives all of its nutrition from harboring microbes inside of it. And the, the unique chemistry from the vents is providing this energy that these animals are using. And then there's other animals that are just cruising around like an octopus. That's not a vent animal, but what it is, is an animal that's a vagrant species that could be found outside of the vent, but it's finding lots of food and lots of things to feed on around the vent, so it's hanging around there. So you have your obligate creatures that could not survive if they weren't near the vent. That's dead. And then you have your other crit critters that are, that are just kind of coming in and using the carbon. And the really important thing, point to bring home here is that these are our sources of autochthonous uh, carbon production. So they're from within the system. They're not being rained down from above. They're not being derived from photosynthetic. It's all being produced within the system. And this is another theme you're going to see throughout my talk today. So as I mentioned, Rob uh, uh, very much kindly and uh, got us involved in the stable isotope stuff. And I started looking at this. Hey, you know what? Around these hydrothermal systems, there could be chemosynthetic activity. And we'll be able to see that by looking at the stable isotopes. Because the stable isotopes basically are the difference in the number of neutrons, and therefore the mass. So carbon-13 is actually is heavier than carbon-12. And all biology, it seems, prefers the lighter version. So it, when it can, it's going to grab the carbon-12 instead of the carbon-13. So then you can get a signature of the food that it ate, and you are what you eat, or you are what you process, as you're going to see later on when you see some of the gas and, and geochemistry stuff that we're. So it's, our, it, it's not just say well, you are what you eat. It's, it's you are what is coming through your system. And uh, this is what you would typically see right around here. These are the types of values you would see from sta carbon stable isotopes. Uh, between negative 10 and negative 22. And they're very different when you have a chemosynthetic system. Therefore, you can really do modeling. You can see how much chemosynthetic input is coming into a system versus the photosynthetic input. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we were able to find these shallow hydrothermal vents. Most people didn't even realize these existed. Um, and I still find people today that are you know, mystified by this. But they're just occurring along faults. They're not quite the same as the deep sea ones. One of the interesting things about them is that they have what we call gasohydrothermal activity. So there's hot water, hot fluids coming out, but there's also free gas that bubbles out because of the reduced load of the hydrostatic pressure. These are at shallower depths. So the gas is not dissolved within the fluids, within the liquids. It actually comes out as a free phase. And that turns out to be really important in terms of giving you information about the system. So they're located within the euphotic zone, obviously. They're shallow water. Um, I'm talking about the deepest ones I've ever experienced are about 35 uh, meters water depth. And I don't care to dive any deeper than that. So let's just say they stop there. And uh, so they, do, they are relying on, on typical uh, photosynthetic input. However, there are also areas where you see chemosynthetic input as well. You see microbial mats like the deep sea vents because you have the same kind of chemistry in these environments. Um, turns out these things are all over Baja, um, and the reason for that is because of the uh, regional uh, extension that happened with the opening of the Baja Peninsula. I'm not going to belabor this because Gary's not in the room. 
because um, you know Gary geology controls biology, right? So we'll just ignore that for now. And here you can see the areas, the locations of several different shallow vents that occur throughout Baja California. I'm going to talk about three of them today. Well, two in general, and one more I'll mention. The first one is Bahia Concepcion, and as I mentioned. Foster, when I remember when he first interviewed me when I was coming to Moss Landing, he said, would you be interested in working in Mexico? And I said, sure. And then he didn't really say much anything else. And then I found out I got in and that he had accepted me. And the only reason really, I think, was so we could drink beer together on the beach. But it's a beautiful place, and, I, and I'm so fortunate to have been able to work in this, in this incredible environment. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Diana Steller had been working on a rotolith bed outside. I imagine most of the people in this room know what rotoliths are, right? We'll talk about them a little bit. But uh, she was working on the bed, and she saw that some, in some places the rotolith looked, which, as she described it, very stressed. And when she put her hand in the sediment, she was like, oh my gosh, it just burned my hand. So that's when we first kind of knew what was going on. We saw, we went back, we looked at it a couple times. We saw the gas bubbling out. We didn't really know the extent of it, um, but it, it seemed very interesting. And I was tired of my sea stars at the time. So I was ready for something new. <laughs> and uh, we were lucky enough. This is one of the Moss Landing things. We were lucky enough to have Gary Green decide it was okay to bring his, you know, $100,000 plus uh, piece of equipment, a side scan sonar, down to Mexico. I see you shaking your head back there. And, uh, and go down and pull this behind a fisherman's boat and, uh, you know, get some data. And it was awesome. It was really cool. We were really looking ostensibly to map the rotolith beds, but my ulterior motive was to get it out over this thing. And what you can see in this picture is these things I'm calling VF vent features. And what those are, actually, and also notice that there's sort of linear. You can't really tell that from this. But we could see that on the record, that there's a nice linear arrangement, which suggests that it's a fault-controlled system. <clears throat> so what is this stuff? Well, it's actually areas where hot fluids and gas is coming through the sediments. And it's causing the sediments to dome up a little bit. And it's changing the reflectivity of the sediments. And on top of that was invariably that green stuff that you see when you dive on it. And this was you know, what I first thought was a microbial mat. It must be, just like the deep sea vents. I'm going to take a look at these animals. In fact, you can see uh, one of Dave James urchins over there right next to it. What are those guys called? Yeah, so toxopanustes, which you're not supposed to touch, but I ended up touching a lot of them. <laughs> I'm not convinced they're toxic. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, uh, there, there are animals that are clearly feeding around this area. Um, one of the first things that we did is Kenneth Cole helped me build this really cool little coring device that we could take discrete samples through a sandy sediment matrix, which was really hard to do, actually. In mud, it's a lot easier because the mud likes to stay in the core. The sand likes to fall right out of the core. Also, when you start to suck with a syringe off a of part of the, of the uh, core, what you're doing is you're just sucking water out of everywhere. But he figured out a way to, to give us discrete sample. And we can see that it worked, because you can see as you go down in the cores, the one on the right there is temperature. And you can see as you get down to 15 centimeters, you're at 85 degrees Celsius. We also saw a really nice pH gradient. So the left now is the vent. And you got down to almost 6 on the pH as you started going down into the core. So thanks, Kenneth. That was very cool. Um, so I first, as I mentioned, I wanted to look at the stable isotope values. I wanted to find evidence that there was chemosynthetic input into the system. So I just went out and I grabbed a lot of animals, um, fish, sponges, corals, whatever we could find, sea cucumbers. And it turned out that the sea cucumbers were pretty interesting. And what was happening is this is actually uh, a sea cucumber that's all over Bahia Concepcion. And these were the stable isotope signatures that you see up there in that corner for the ones that were outside from the vent. These are the ones that were in the vent, OK? And so that's, when you see that kind of a difference with stable isotope signatures, this is significantly different. And we had, you know, we had uh, six and seven of them. You know, not as many as you might like, but that's pretty good. That's better than two, for sure, <laughs> or one. <coughs> so what was happening? These guys were definitely feeding on this flocculent material, on this mat. And I could see that because I could watch them mow it, kind of like they were mowing the lawn. And I could watch them pooping it out behind them. And then when we caught them to sample them, unfortunately, I had to kill them. So we cut them open, took a look at them. And sure enough, their guts were packed full of this stuff. So and you can see that clearly something in their diet was making them different than your typical guys throughout the rest of the bit. <clears throat> so uh, I was able to work with Victoria Orphan, who at the time was at Ambari and NASA Ames. She was really interested because she studies microbes. And it turned out she said, OK, here's your DNA stain with DAPI, and then here's your bacteria. 
you got bacteria in there, but you don't really have a really interesting system in terms of the microbes. Uh, it's not like a deep sea hydrothermal vent. You're not seeing a true microbial mat. So what is this stuff? Well, we did elemental analyses. It's 8% carbon, 1% nitrogen, 1% iron, 2% aluminum. And then the arsenic, which will come into play a little later again, concentrations were very high in this environment. And this is natural. This is not any kind of human pollution or anything like that. <clears throat> um, the stable isotope values, again, they're pretty solidly indicative of something that came from a photosynthetic environment. So this would be pretty standard from cyanobacteria, uh, eubacteria, but not a true sulfide-derived chemosynthetic system. <clears throat> so what do we have? We, have? we don't have typical hydrothermal microbes. We have precipitates that are heavily colonized by a community of morphologically diverse bacteria. And, and throughout those precipitates is a lot of actual metals that are being precipitated out. A lot of this is actually what we call iron oxyhydroxides. And iron oxyhydroxides are really good at sorbing up different types of minerals. <clears throat> so what are the geological implications? Again, I was fortunate enough to go down with Gary Green, who's a great geologist in his own right. And then we also hooked up with a Mexican geologist, Jorge Ledesma Vazquez, who this area was his specialty. And I was able to spend a week in the field with him, drinking tequila. No, um, well, we did a little. But we mostly looked at the geology, and we mapped out the whole place. And we got the fault, and we looked at everything. Ivano also helped me a lot with that stuff, um, mapping the faults and looking at what we call conjugate fractures. I'm not going to talk about that today because it's geology, and nobody cares. Um, but what, what people had always said, <laughs> don't, don't give me that look. What people had always said about Bahia Concepcion is that it was controlled by the fault that they named the Concepcion Fault Zone, which is the one on the right-hand side, the one on the, on the eastern margin of Bahia Concepcion. And what you can see here, I don't know if this does work, but anyway, what you can see, oh, it does. This is what's called a bajada, which is coalescing alluvial fans. What that indicates is that there's very active uplift going on here and then active erosion coming down. Okay, so the, they said, okay, we're going to call that the Concepcion Fault Zone. It was named in the literature. Then people had always said, we know there's probably a fault zone on this side as well. Um, because of the steep escarpment of the side. But we don't know what it's called. We don't have a name for it. So we said, hey, we can give it a name. We'll call it the El Recason Fault Zone. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we actually published this. It's still, I've seen other people refer to it as the El Recason Fault Zone. I wouldn't say it's necessarily been accepted completely by the geologists. But uh, we're, we're going with it anyway. And uh, so some of the things about it is that they're related to the opening of the Gulf of California. These are old systems, okay? These are old faults. Um, the hot springs on the western shore, and you can see where I've got those marked off here, uh, indicate that there's a fault that is actively acting as a conduit, like in the deep sea, allowing that hot fluid to come up in those areas. There's also paleoversions on the peninsula, this Gavilon uh, manganese mine, and something here called the mono chert. These are paleo versions of some of the hydrothermal activity. <clears throat> so why Recus El Recason? El Recus Recason means cottage cheese curds, <laughs> which is a pretty weird name for a fault, I'll be the first to admit. But it's named after a prominent geographic location, which is what you're supposed to do with the fault. And that would be Mike Foster's favorite place, Isla El Recason. We would camp out on this. This is a tombolo, which is connected to this island at low tide, but at high tide it becomes disconnected. It, there's a channel that goes through. And we would camp out on this side and get away from all the yahoos and the RVs over on the other side. And it was a great place to camp. And that's where we ran the class for many, many years, and it was really great. Um, and then the reason for Recasone, as it's called, is because the rotolith pieces actually look like cottage cheese curds. And that was the name that was given to it, I believe, by some of the Spanish explorers early on. <clears throat> so rotoliths, as most of you know, are free-living, non-geniculate coral algae, very similar to the type of, of coral algae you'd see right out here. But these happen to be rolling around in balls on the bottom, living free in soft substrate. They are the major carbonate producers in Bahia Concepcion. And there's a huge fossil record that dates back to the Pliocene that's all around there. So there's massive sequences of it that indicates that this has been a very productive system for a long time, and these rotoliths have been part of that system. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, there, there's gaso-hydrothermal venting in these shallow vents, and that's what this free gas that you're seeing here is bubbling up. So we would collect this gas uh, at seven meter water depths along the fault line, 
to try to do some analyses again with stable isotopes. And also to look at the composition of the gas. Now, I was expecting this to be a lot of methane, which is really common in hydrothermal systems. Turns out, or CO2, which is the other thing that's the most common. It turns out it's mostly nitrogen. But then there was a lot of CO2 in it. And, um, you know, these, these numbers, again, are pretty standard that this would indicate, instead of being like a deep sea microbial seep, that this is a system where you have heat and it's breaking down algal matter. And that's what's deriving this, the, the methane. This is what you get the methane from. <clears throat> We also were able to do, and this was the first time anyone's ever done this um, in this type of environment. Um, I worked with Justin Kulingowski at USGS and at Scripps. We were able to go and collect in copper tubes samples that we could analyze for helium stable isotopes. If you collect gas to analyze for helium in glass, it will actually leak through the glass because it's such a small molecule. So you have to use the impermeable copper tubes to seal this sample in. And what that tells you is it tells you the amount of mantle helium is coming into the system. Helium-3 is what we call primordial helium. It's only found deep within the core of the Earth. It's all the rest of it has escaped already into the atmosphere. So when you see a signature like this, this tells you that there is actually some mantle helium in the system. In this case, about 16%. And that's what your heat is. There's a, there's a mantle source underneath providing the heat for the system. Um, then, as I mentioned, the, the nitrogen stable and the methane um, stable isotopes indicate that this is thermogenic. This is heat busting down algal material. And then I think, and this was just kind of my brain, that the CO2 in the gas is probably from dissolving the rotoliths. And Dai actually had done some stuff where she looked at stable isotope values of rotoliths, and you can see that the values that we got from the CO2, the, the delta 13C, were very similar to what she was getting from the rotoliths. And from what I talked to the experts, they said that would be very common amount of fractionation that you would expect to see. So it's very likely that this was derived from the rotolus, the CO2 in the gas. And um, you know, an ecologist at Moss Landing, this was my first paper that I ever published, The Gas Geochemistry of a Shallow Summer. Another exciting title, I might add. I got a little better with my titles, as you'll see. But again, I'd like to point out my co-authors here, Jorge Ledesma Vazquez, an amazing guy at UABC. He's retired now. Uh, and Ensenada, incredible geologist and a wonderful person. Bill Usler from Mbari, uh, Justin, as I mentioned before, and, and Gary Green. Um, great set of people to work with on this, and I learned so much you know, that, that I never would have learned as an ecologist, and I never would have learned if I was still looking at sea stars. Uh, I then took, uh, took some Mexican colleagues down to the vent. They met me at a meeting, and they were interested in checking out the vent. They wanted to hire me as a guide, which I thought was really funny. It's like, so wait, you're Mexican and you want an American guy to come down and be your guide. Okay, cool. But uh, I decided, hey, why don't we work together instead? And so, yeah, they, they threw me on the paper out of kindness. No, we worked a lot together, and we did a lot of really cool work together. We looked at the, uh, the fluid, the liquid chemistry, and we also looked at the, um, and when I say that liquid, the reason is fluids also means gas. Gas is a fluid, okay? So when you talk about fluids in this case, you're talking about both the gas and the liquid phases of these things. And we also were able to look at mineralization. It's really cool. Stromatolites were forming actively around this shallow water hydrothermal vent. Stromatolites are some of the oldest evidence of life on this planet. So these are potential analogs for really ancient systems that provided for some of the first life on this, on this planet. Um, as I mentioned, these sea, star, or these sea cucumbers were, were eating this flocculent material, and it definitely showed a little bit of a difference. I also mentioned that the flocking material is very high in arsenic, but we didn't find any evidence that it was hurting these animals. Okay, so it may well be that by t being tied up with those iron oxyhydroxides that I mentioned, that it's not biologically available. Okay, um, the vent fluids were acidic. They're enriched in silica, manganese, iron, and arsenic. And that is just due to interactions with the type of rocks that are around it. That's not due to any kind of pollution source from humans. This is, this is a natural system. And as I mentioned, I think that the high levels of calcium and carbonate um, that are in these, these gas samples and in the fluid samples is probably due to the dissolution of rotoliths. There were no sulfides in the system. You never, it's interesting, I found this out later, but you, your nose is probably the best indicator of whether there are sulfides in the system, better than most tests that you can go and get. So if you don't smell sulfide in the system, there's probably not sulfide in the system. And um, we don't know for sure whether it was fresh water or boiled seawater, but everybody's leaning towards that it's actually fresh water that's coming out of these vents in the ocean. And that's not that unusual, and we can talk about that later if you're interested. 
or you can go talk to Charlie Paul and he'll tell you all about it. Um, so, and we did some, uh, some, uh, some calculations using uh, the gas and fluid geochemistry, and we came up with some estimates of how deep, how hot it would be at depth. So up to 220 degrees Celsius. It's a pretty cooking system. Uh, the geological conclusions that this fault zone formed during the opening of the Proto-Gulf, it may have been the first fault that caused the opening of Bahia Concepcion. Um, the faults uh, right now are acting as conduits for the hydrothermal fluids and gases, or liquids and gases. And then, as I mentioned, there's similar paleohydrothermal activity along the Concepcion fault zone on the other side, um, including the monochurts. And we believe that this is an example of paleohydrothermal activity, and there's Ivano doing some measurements. And um, what you see right here is you see a layer of black. That black is actually rotolith root fossils, Man I'm sorry, mangrove root fossils. So in other words, what this system likely was, was an area where hydrothermal venting was going through a mangrove forest. And it basically petrified, silicified some of these roots. And we have the exact same thing in a modern analog right here, going through modern mangroves in Santa Spock on the beach. So we got another paper for, out of this one, or, or a couple um, uh, different presentations. We did, in fact, uh, I didn't want you to open that controversial bag. <laughs> Ivano has an alternative explanation for it, and you know, like all geology, that's the problem with geology. And, and, and this is a great thing that Mike Foster would always say, you know, I love you geologists because every publication, you get two publications, and the geologists say, what do you mean? Well, you get your original interpretation, then you get your retraction a couple of months later. <laughs> and there is some truth to that. But then for my first year project at Scripps, I started trying to continue on this. And this time on the Pacific side, at about 35 meters, right near the Bufadora, just south of Ensenada, if you guys know where that is, there's a place called Punta Banda. And uh, there were two guys at Scripps, the Vidal brothers, who had done their PhD thesis looking at a shallow hydrothermal vent there. And it was a really interesting system. It did have real microbial mats. It, the methane in this system was, was about 60%. And the, bio, the signature from the methane was biological. So there were real microbial mats in the system. And I went around and I did this stable isotope shotgun thing again. And what I found is that this fish, who knows what that is? Black eye goby. <laughs> the black eye goby is hanging around these vents, and his, this is what his signature looks like from, from, uh, from eating around these vents. This is what the typical stuff should look like that, you know, if it was derived only from phytoplankton and kelp. So, the black eye goby is a vent fish. <laughs> no, what it really is, is a cosmopolitan species that found the vent and moved in. There's a lot of food there, you know, and it's warm, you know, it's great. When I try to chase them off, they'd just come right back. You know, when you catch them, if you didn't catch them, they'd come right back. They were definitely, they, they do, they're harem uh, nest garters, I believe, so they, they do find a spot and they don't move from it. That's pretty typical of their behavior. So I don't think they were actually eating the mats, although we did see our models suggested that 36% of the carbon and nitrogen that they were driving was from the microbial mat. Um, but they were probably feeding on little grazers that were eating the mats. And that would make sense, again, with their biology. So, um, what I want to emphasize here is that, again, we have autochthonous carbon. We have carbon coming from within the system, and now we have an animal that's eating it. And we see similar types of things in the terrestrial system as well. So another theme that's going to be repeated down the line here. So I'm calling this the evolution of my scientific work. Um, I found that the deep sea was basically totally off limits to me because, for one thing, I don't like ships. Um, I get really seasick. And uh, the shallow vents were difficult to access, and there weren't very many of them. So that's really a problem for statistical analyses. And um, you know, you have your problems with pseudo-replication. So all these guys that just destroyed ecology, you know, and they wouldn't let me work on this stuff. And uh, what I found was in the terrestrial realm, that's not the case, because there's a lot of these things, and they're well studied. So there are much better uh, systems to elucidate these complex relationships between what I'm calling physico-chemical in other words, the pH, the temperature, the conductivity, and the chemistry all being related to, uh, to be uh, different parameters, and then the biology within them. So they're kind of natural laboratories, if you will. Now, here's how many of them there are in this area. And you can see they're pretty much all focused on the west. They're all occurring along faults. So again, back to the idea of the faults acting as a conduit for the hot waters coming out. 
This is the Great Basin region, and you can see how many there are in this one area. <clears throat> so I was, uh, you know, really interested in these systems. And again, what we have is we have a system where it's very similar to the deep sea vents. It just happens to be on land. And you're getting interaction, you're getting heat from below, the magmatic intrusion. It's heating up the, the water that's then interacting with the rocks. Essentially, think about boiling rocks for thousands of years. What you're going to do is you're going to take some, strip some of the minerals and some of the, the elements out of the rocks. And that's going to come up in the water. <clears throat> so this was one of the projects, again, that I did with Justin Kulingowski from USGS. Uh, we were interested in whether hydrothermal systems in Napa and Sonoma Valley, where Greg gets a lot of his wine, uh, are being tainted, are being contaminated by hydrothermal systems. And Matt Edwards helped me a lot with this stuff. I wish he were here today, but I think he had to go to San Diego to help one of his students defend. <laughs> so we analyzed a very complex data set of isotopic and chemistry data from 45, 44 public supply wells in uh, Napa and Sonoma counties. And then we identified using uh, multivariate analyses that it looked like nine of these were being contaminated by hydrothermal stuff. Uh, we did a mixing model that suggested that up to 30% of it was being contaminated, was contaminated water. And that some of these wells, this is the concern, exceed the arsenic. Again, this is natural. This is not because of pollution. They exceed the arsenic levels, fluoride and boron, of drinking water standards or notification levels, which is a problem. And it turns out that people in Calistoga don't even drink their water up there. So if you guys have been drinking Calistoga water, you might want to think about that. <laughs> So, uh, as I mentioned, we did some really complex uh, statistical analyses, and Matt Edwards helped me a lot with this. Um, and what did we come up with? We came up with a really nice pattern here. The hot wells, these are the hydrothermal wells, are right over here. These guys with the purple triangles are what we're calling the mixed wells. And then the other ones, the blue guys, are the, are the, uh, the clean wells, the you know, nice fresh water wells. These are actually seawater intrusion. We didn't have enough to do much with those, but we had two wells that clearly had saltwater intrusion in them. Um, and uh, you can see a little overlap here, but otherwise the pattern's very nice. Multidimensional scaling is a nice, gives you a nice picture of how things cluster together. But it doesn't tell you much about why. Well, what tells you why is principal component analyses. So we did that next, and what did it turn out? It turned out that elevated concentrations of chloride, lithium, arsenic, fluoride, boron, and higher water temperatures, obviously, but also that they were hi having higher helium stable isotope ratios. So again, we have this really powerful tool that allows us to really quantify how much contamination is going on. And by the way, I, I belabor this, the helium stable isotope stuff because it's incredibly expensive to run these analyses. So, and, and very few people can do it. So there, there again is where you want to find a good colleague who can do this stuff for you. And then you put them on your paper and everybody's happy. Uh, the mixing model that we used was developed by somebody in Sweden, but it seemed to work. And uh, it indicated, as I said, that up to 30% of uh, some of these wells were being contaminated. These are the blue ones here. And, and it you know, gives you, this is what, this is actually um, our end member. And what that is, is the geyser in Calistoga, if anybody knows what that is. And that comes out of the ground literally at 100 degrees Celsius. So it's a great end member. <laughs> and uh, then we had, you know, the salt water here. And we had the groundwater, which was just basically our purest water source that we could use. So um, the conclusions from this part of my work was that hot water rock interactions alters geochemistry, just as we saw in the deep sea, just as we're seeing everywhere else in the terrestrial environment. Uh, but this is contaminating nearby public supply aquifers and for drinking and irrigation. I actually did just read a paper recently where they were finding elevated amounts of arsenic and wine from Napa. And um, I would guarantee that that's why. OK, so the best tracers I mentioned were these, this slew right here. And some of these guys actually had arsenic and fluoride concentrations that exceeded the MCL, the maximum contamination limit set, which means that they can cause cancer, lots of fluoride in your system. A little fluoride's good. A lot of fluoride, not so good. It actually weakens your bones and your teeth. So it can cause a lot of problems. And again, we got a paper out of it, voila. And uh, now, apparently, I am, you know, completely a geochemist. So, <clears throat> uh, so then I moved on to um, an interesting study where I was looking at sort of biogeographical patterns of these springs. We can think about these springs as being island ecosystems surrounded by the seas of the desert. You know, sort of like the deep sea vents where these oases that were in the desert of the deep sea. 
Um, in the past, a lot of this, this area, this is the Great Basin, was covered by lakes, Paleo Lakes, as recently as 10,000 years ago. And that probably had a lot more connectivity between these systems. When that dried out, um, then these systems became isolated little islands on their own. And so some of the species may have been more widely distributed in the past, but then had to settle into these springs, and that was their last refuge where they could hang out. This is um, why we decided that this was a great place to study it, because they are numerous and relatively well studied. I thought you'd like this one, Mike. They're small, yet they, they support a disproportionate number of species, so therefore they're keystone ecosystems. <laughs> They often contain endemic species found nowhere else. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. It's very cool patterns. And due to their isolation unusual chemistry, we were kind of coming into this idea that they could protect these relic species from invasives and different things. But it looks like they're definitely holding on to some of these species. Um, I was fortunate enough to pester this guy about a thousand times. He finally said, OK, you can use my data set. And he's been doing this as his life's work. Um, he's been collecting data from 1,500 springs in the Great Basin. You know, this is a little different than three hydrothermal systems in Baja, right? So we have a really nice data set. He's got the physical chemical parameters that you see listed there. Also biotic factors, including endemic, non-native, introduced species. Um, so a really great data set, really complex. Took a lot of massaging to, to get it to where I could analyze it. But, you know, it was a of love and it was really worth it. So what we're going to talk about is three different basic types of springs that we're going to see in this system. Um, you have local aquifer cold springs, and that would be like this guy here, okay? So what, what it, the recharge is very close in the local mountains. It's not staying underground for very long. It's coming up cold, and it's very fresh, and it's good. Then you have what are called local aquifer geothermal systems. That would be this guy here. So they're similar. They're not staying underground for very long, but they're coming up a fault. So that fault is allowing the heat to escape and heat them up. And then we have a third type that we're calling a regional aquifer spring. The regional aquifer spring is being, it's being recharged in the, in somewhere in the mountains in the very distant area. It's going underground. It's staying underground for a long time. It's warming up just due to a geothermal gradient underground. It's coming out usually at about 40 degrees Celsius, and it comes out again on a fault. So they are thermal springs, but their chemistry is very different, particularly because this particular system is underlaid by a carbonate system. So that changes the chemistry quite a bit from if it were a volcanic system or a sedimentary, a normal sedimentary system. So as I mentioned before, the Great Basin had interesting paleohydrological connections. You can see Utah was basically a big lake, a lot less Mormons at that time. Uh, Nevada um, had a lot more water, including Lake Manly in the bottom of uh, Death Valley that people would have interacted with, a nice big lake down there with lots of fish and lots of things in there. Um, it may have also been connected to the Colorado River drainage basin during the Pliocene. So there was a lot of chances for animals to move around in the past, whereas now they're going to be stuck wherever they ended up. <clears throat> so for one place, Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge, where I did a lot of work, really cool place. I totally recommend you guys go out and check it out right outside of Death Valley. It's part of the Death Valley um, system, actually. Uh, and it's home to 25 at least endemic species, including 13 endangered or threatened species, all in these little springs, these regional aquifer springs, a series of them. The desert pupfish, um, they live in here. In fact, the Devil's Hole pupfish, which some of you may have heard of, lives right in this area in a deep limestone cave here. So it's the highest concentration of uh, endemic species of anywhere in the United States. There's a place called Cuatro Cienegas in Mexico that actually has more, and it's a really similar type of a system. Desert pupfish, I mostly saw this slide because they're so cute and everybody loves them. This is the number of, uh, of pupfish that live just in ash meadows right here. So very cool animals, very hardy, live in some terrible environments that nobody else would want to live, and um, they seem to do quite well. They're very abundant. Uh, this is a complex story that I'm sure Greg could tell you a lot more about. Um, Turns out they're not quite, uh, they've probably been hybridized, a lot of these guys already, um, due to things that happened in the past. <clears throat> and another thing that, that, that you see in a lot of these, these springs are spring snails. This is four of them on some guy's fingernail. So these are pretty small little guys. And there's 80 plus species in the Great Basin, many of which are endemic to a single spring or a single spring system. So they're only found in one spring in the entire world, the species. 
Um, this is an area that's not a regional aquifer. This is a geothermal local aquifer. It's in uh, Soldier Meadow up in northern Nevada. And um, you see that there are unique species within this system and that they're pretty old. These things have been around for about five million years according to the molecular clocks. But we all know how molecular clocks work. <laughs> So anyway, um, back to the hypotheses we were looking at with this database that, that Don Sato provided me. He works at the Desert Research Institute, by the way, great guy. Um, the hydrothermal springs ecosystems, including the geothermal and the regional aquifers, support a disproportionate number of relic species, endemic species, and species vulnerable to extinction. The second part of that is, as I mentioned, we thought it might exclude some of the competitors and some of the invaders. Well, it turns out that some of it was right and some of it wasn't. And so we did the same type of, uh, of analyses, and here in the blue squares are your local, I'm sorry, your regional aquifer springs. These are your geothermal springs, and the blue, again, are the cold springs. And you can see a nice, nice pattern coming out here as well. This is of the biological and physical data. <clears throat> uh, the PCA, again, gives you information about what's driving these patterns. Now, I know nobody can read that because there's too much going on. But you do see a nice pattern again, very nice, I think, in this case, with these light blue guys all coming out over here. Um, some of the red guys also coming in there, but the blue guys are mostly outside of this. So what is causing that? I just made you some pretty pictures so you could see this a little better. It's whale activity offshore there. I don't get to see that in San Diego as much anymore. Uh, and this is a pupfish. This is a spring snail. This is what I'm going to talk about next. There, it turns out there's a lot of amphibians living in these systems, and that's a pretty cool story. Uh, there's also, unfortunately, a lot of invasive species, and a lot of these things are loved to death. People love to get into hot springs, it turns out, so they, uh, they put their bathtubs and stuff out there, and they really mess with the flows. They get their Dr. Brunner soap all over the place, you know. So um, the other thing is they're very stable, okay? They have the same temperature year-round. They have the same salinity year-round. Um, they don't blow out because of where they're located. They don't get flooded out very often which would be a bad thing if you were a pupfish living in a, in a spring that you get blown out. They're also not subject to as much disturbance from cattle, uh, feral horses. They're not wild horses, by the way. Uh, diversion and uh, basically people using them for irrigation of crops. But they were in the past, unfortunately. I'll show you some pictures later where you can see that. Um, and as with the marine hydrothermal ecosystems, the interesting thing about these terrestrial hydrothermal springs is they also seem to have a lot of autochthonous carbon in them. They have a lot of production from within. These are cyanobacterial mats that are forming in the areas where the hot water is coming out. A lot, cyanobacteria is not particularly palatable to most animals, but little chains of diatoms grow on this and things graze on them. So similar to what was going on probably with, with the, uh, the vent gobies, we're seeing the pupfish being able to derive nutrition from these autochthonous sources. And in fact, somebody else did some stable isotopes, and they found, lo and behold, that in the winter in particular, the pupfish are getting 112% of their carbon from this, which is high. <laughs> Even in the winter, they're getting 67% of their carbon for it. So in other words, the part of the reason, perhaps, why these are such great places for these guys to end up and persist is there's a lot of food there for them, and it's coming from within the system, autochthonous carbon again. <clears throat> So the, as I mentioned, the, the tests that we did, and we found, yes, most endemic vulnerable species are found in regional aquifer hydrothermal springs, and some are also occurring in the local geothermal springs. However, these guys were a lot more disturbed and invaded than we thought they were. And they're also harboring a lot of invasive species. Unfortunately, sometimes that's because some guy has an aquarium fish, and he sees this, and he goes, I bet you my fish would survive a cichlid if I dump it into this thing, because it's nice and warm and it's a little salty. And sure enough, they survive. <laughs> so you've, got, you've actually got tropical fish swimming around in the desert. And in fact, there's a place in Utah where you can go dive with tropical marine fish in the, near the Great Salt Lake. True story, which is a regional aquifer spring. <clears throat> uh, OK, so to, to sort of summarize this part of the talk, um, hydrothermal springs are very long-lived in their stable systems. They don't freeze, so that's great. You know, it kind of sucks to be frozen out by some, if you're an animal. Uh, there are very constant temperatures, geochemistry, and again, as I mentioned, they may be more self-sufficient due to all this autochthonous product, productivity that's there. So the next thing I started working on, and I, again, sort of, this was serendipity for sure. I went and visited Rob and Christy in the back there. They were uh, working for the Nature Conservancy at the time in Arizona. I ran into a guy named Martin Schlopfer, 
He tells me, hey, you know this disease that's killing amphibians all around the world caused by a fungus, we're not finding it in the geothermal systems, probably because the temperature is excluded. Like, wow, that's really cool. And are you going to continue to study this? No, I'm done. Well, do you mind if I do it? He said, sure, go ahead. So I just started slogging around swamps uh, all over Arizona. And here's what we found. Well, first of all, amphibians face a lot of threats. I don't know. This is probably <laughs> dating me, although I think they came out with a new version of Frogger, right? <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk mostly about infectious disease. This is this BD, chytrid fungus. Um, habitat destruction and invasive species. That's particularly bullfrogs. Bullfrogs were brought all over the West because people like to eat frogs' legs. And they're a real nuisance. <laughs> Uh, BD is a major cause of amphibian declines throughout the world. This has actually been updated, and there's a lot more positive hits of BD now, and a lot of species are dying. In fact, 50% of all known species of amphibians are in decline. Why do we care? Don't forget, amphibians were the first land tetrapods, okay? So the fact that they're being wiped out at an alarming rate, we might want to think about this sort of canary in the coal mine, right? <clears throat> Plus, they eat bugs. <laughs> This is just real quickly how this works. I don't even try to pronounce this word. If anyone knows how to pronounce it, I'd love for you to do it right now. We just call it BD. And I love this quote. It's the most deadly invasive species on the planet, excluding humans. And what it does is it disrupts their skin function. Amphibians do everything through their skin. If their skin is not working properly, they're going to die. <clears throat> this is what happens. And this is what happens up in the mountains. This is the red-legged frog um, up in the Sierras. And it's sort of like silent spring all over again up there, or at least it was about 10 years ago. All the frogs that were in all these things were floating dead, you know. And uh, it's particularly important that you have cold areas. What happens in, in the cold is amphibians basically shut their immune system down because it's too cold for them to continue to operate. And they go into, it's not really hibernation. We'll call it torpor just for ease of use. And they're just basically just surviving, sometimes under ice. And then when that clears up and it starts to warm up, they come out. They haven't ramped their immune system up yet because they haven't even eaten or anything yet. They don't have the energy for it. But this BD starts going crazy, and it gets all over the place, and it kills them. So it's really in these colder areas where we saw the major declines and in the wintertime. <clears throat> and the lab studies had shown that, in fact, this disease, this fungus, dies at 28 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> So, as I said, I started sampling all these hot springs, different areas um, in Arizona. And Arizona's great because it's loaded with hot springs that are loaded with amphibians. At first I thought it was really weird. What are amphibians doing in hot springs? But now that I think about it, it makes complete sense because they're ectotherms, right? They're, they're cold-blooded, which means they can find the perfect temperature for themselves in any one of these systems at any time. Let's say 30 degrees Celsius is the best temperature for you to grow and reproduce at. There's 30 degrees Celsius right there. So they can actually find habitat that's perfect for their temperatures. And as long as the chemistry is not too crazy, then they can survive in it as well. <clears throat> so materials and methods, real quickly, I hunted. I did hunt at night, but it's hard to take pictures. Uh, this is a really cool spot that's called Mammoth Hot Well. Apparently, this, this well was sunk 150 years ago due to oil exploration. I think it was a pyramid scheme, Ponzi scheme myself. They just left it flowing for 150 years, and it's flowing like a fire hydrant, 42 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it made a wetland. And the beautiful thing about this wetland is year-round, it's the same temperature in this area. Then the wetland continues over this way, and you get it cooling off. It's a perfect little natural laboratory for temperature experiments. A guy did his PhD thesis in there in 1965, and the way he described the system was exactly the same, except for one thing. And that was there used to be mosquito fish in here. Rob drained it and got rid of the mosquito fish. And he did get rid of the bullfrogs for a short period of time, but not forever. But the mosquito fish, as far as I know, are still going. This is actually a little frog, the low and leopard frog, hanging out in some of this muck, this autochthonous production that's going on around this vent. And he's really happy. He couldn't be happier. I asked him. Uh, so we, what we did is wherever we caught the animals, we took the temperature exactly where we caught them. Here's 39 degrees Celsius. We didn't catch a lot of animals at that temperature, as you might imagine. But we did at 35, 32, you know, different temperatures like that. They seem to really like 28 to 30 degrees is really where we caught a lot of them. Uh, we swabbed them with these special swabs that take skin samples, which then can be analyzed for this BD fungus in the lab. I measured them. That's a bullfrog. That's why he's so big. And then uh, uh, I think Rob said I was making crystal meth here in this picture. But I'm really weighing with a Pizzoli scale of frog. It does look pretty gross. <laughs> and then we kiss and release. 
not really. Um, and so we, we actually went through, um, now I've added to that number quite a bit, and this pattern is very, it holds for sure. What you see is you get up to 28 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius, and it drops off, the amount of animals that are infected with this fungus drops off like crazy. In fact, it can go from 90% down to less than 10%. So it was very, it was definitely significantly different, and it was, it was, we were seeing this pattern over and over again. Uh, this was something that Eric Sandoval, I guess he's not here, he helped me with. He was a student at Moss at the same time. And we made a little GIS map of the temperatures. These are the infected ones. You can see they're almost all in this cold area. Here's one guy who's up in the warm part, and this is, you know, between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius up here. And I think he probably came up there recently to, because he felt diseased. All ectotherms, when they feel diseased, will do what's called behavioral fever. They will try to warm themselves up. Often that means basking in the sun. But if you have a hot spring right there, then you just go up into the hot part of the hot spring. So this was the first study where anybody had certainly used a hot spring to study amphibians. But also to take the temperature right where we caught the animals and have a nice steep temperature gradient in nature. And we got it into PLOS One. And now I got a cuter title. And I found, wow, if you put a cute title on there, people cite your paper. And this is also sort of a throwback to my uh, literature days. That's actually a quote from uh, Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar. There may be some things a hot bath won't cure, but I don't know many of them. <laughs> she ended up killing herself. So you know, I mean, that didn't really work. But anyway, the irony wasn't lost on us. <laughs> OK, so uh, this was a paper that just came out this month. I just got this a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, she's saying that the same animals I was studying and some of the same sites I was studying, the hot springs are source populations for the other populations. In other words, these animals probably all died because of BD fungus. They're not in hot springs. And what happened is the animals came out of the hot springs. It says migration was unidirectional from the geothermal springs. OK, so all the 21, 27% of the ancestors were coming first or second generation from the hot springs. And you can see this is a wash. So what happens in Arizona is you get really big rains certain times of the year, monsoon. And that would connect these systems. So then these guys could actually go down. This is several kilometers. Um, but I love this quote. This find, these findings underscore the critical importance of geothermal environments for the persistence of amphibians in the desert southwest since the emergence of BD. Amen. So. I thought, hey, you know, is this pattern continuing in other places? It turns out that this is my poster child. This is the relic leopard frog. They were declared extinct in 1918. They live right outside of Las Vegas, believe it or not. And um, they were rediscovered in eight springs in the 1990s. Every one of those springs was a hydrothermal spring, was a geothermal spring, with source temperatures between 30 and 55 degrees Celsius. Here was their distribution in the past, the yellow dots. They were everywhere. That's why it was very alarming when all of a sudden they couldn't find them anymore. They were all on the muddy river the Virgin River, drainage basins from the Colorado River. Now they're only in hot springs. That's the only place that they're naturally found. So again, sort of the poster child for all this. And I'm working with a researcher from UNLV. We're doing some, some experiments right now. Where we're actually trying to kill these guys in the lab with chytrid fungus. And we're getting them exposed to incredibly high amounts that would kill them in nature. And none of them are dying. In fact, they're clearing the fungus, which would suggest that over time, they've developed an immune response to this which is very cool, and I believe that the geothermal habitat helped them develop the immune response. There's two other species that I've been working on. Bufo exul, the black toad, that only occurs near Deep Springs College in this very strange place. It's an all-boys school. I don't recommend you go there. Um, and uh, Actually, it's a great school. And uh, they're living in these, again, thermal springs, OK? They're living in this sulfitic mud in thermal springs. And none of these guys had BD. We tested about 100 of them. None of them had BD. Bufo and Elsoni, we just got a paper accepted about these guys. They live right outside of Beatty, Nevada. And the whole town comes out to sample them. It's a really cool story. There was a story on NPR about it. I can send you guys a link. It's very cool. In fact, one of the, we got help from, uh, there's a brothel in town. And we got help from the, from the ladies in the brothel. It turns out the brothel has a pool in the back. And some of the customers, if you pay extra money, can go swimming with the ladies in the pool. The pool is supplied by a hot spring, by a geothermal source. <laughs> telling you, there's all kinds of endemic species in these things. So and this is one I've been working on lately. And this one is a real mystery. But this is the Dixie Valley toad, the most beautiful toad I've ever seen. He's like, a, you know, it's like gold. And you know, he's really pretty. It looks like, a, it looks like it's bejeweled, I think. You know? <laughs> Don't ask me how I know what that is. Um, anyway, this animal clearly belongs to, we've actually done, um, is, uh, 
other molecular, oh, you know, so we've actually done molecular work on this. I did, yeah, I know, it sounds crazy. I got a lot of help, again. Greg Rouse at Scripps is helping me, and we did, um, we did mitochondrial DNA analyses. These guys do not come out as anything different than the other Western toads. Now we're actually working on microsatellites, and we hope that we can get some more information doing that. And ask, you can ask, uh, ask anyone in this room, and you'll know that I did never wanted to work on molecular stuff. So this was, this was a, there, I was kind of pulled into this one grudgingly, and mostly because we keep trying to publish, and they won't accept the publication. So I'm just going to have to jump through another hoop. But thanks, John Geller. I did take his class back in the day, and I did learn a lot. So. The Dixie Valley toad is currently restricted to wetlands fed by four hydrothermal springs in Dixie Valley, Nevada. Dixie Valley is here, kind of central Nevada. Uh, Fallon is the nearest town, if anybody knows where Fallon is. This is the place where SEAL Team 6 practices. And the minute you walk into here, they consider you an enemy, okay? This is a place where they actually, the only place I know of in the United States that's designated simulated enemy territory. So they start tracking you. They can turn your cell phone off, right? They turn your cell phone off, not your reception, your phone off. They can, they can dither your GPS as you're in the field working anytime they want. They're flying overhead with jets, and there's flares going up. It's, it's a crazy place, and there happens to be a toad that lives in this area. <laughs> and the Nevada Department of Wildlife called my attention to it because they knew what I was doing, and they said, hey, this thing lives in hot springs, and it's really interesting, and it's really different. We think it's a unique species or subpopulation or something because it's only found in this valley, and this valley is completely hydrologically isolated from any other valley in, in Nevada. So they recommended that 100, 410 acres become considered potential area of critical environmental concern. That's why we're really interested in trying to find out what's going on with these guys with the, mic, with the, um, the molecular stuff, because we need more evidence that this is a unique population. Otherwise, they're going to say, forget it. It's not that important. And they're going to you know, let this thing go extinct, in my opinion. So there's bullfrogs all throughout this. Yeah, that, that's a lovely bullfrog eating another frog here. And that happens regularly. We have we've found our species. We picked up a bullfrog. like, damn, this thing's heavy, and squeezed it a little bit. And sure enough, it spat out an armagosa toad. <laughs> so anyway, they're, they're not only that will they eat and outcompete these guys, but they also look like they're a nice reservoir for spreading this disease all around. They don't seem to succumb to it themselves, but they sure like to spread it around. Um, they're found in several of the ponds, including one where the Dixie Valley toad also co-occurs. I was able to sample that for BD last year. Fortunately, the Dixie Valley toad, none of them have BD. So that's a really good thing here. You can see we tested 127 animals. None of them came out positive. So that's cool. That's great. Um, but the population of bullfrogs that we tested went up from 18% to 75%. Those are low numbers. I'm not going to make a lot of dramatic conclusions about that. Um, the, our ends weren't very big. So. <clears throat> but it's possible that these guys are also getting protection from these geothermal habitats. The source temperature is 72 degrees Celsius here. In fact, this is the hottest geothermal system in, in the Great Basin. Um, of course, they're not sitting in 72 degrees Celsius water. They'd be cooked. But, you know, again, you can get this nice gradient. You just move away from the source, and you can find whatever temperature you want. In fact, Cold Spring Pond, the source temperature is 31 degrees Celsius. So that's, that's the cold area here. As I mentioned, geothermal development looks like it's probably the biggest threat to this animal right now. Um, they're really ramping it up in this area. Um, I have no opposition to clean energy, and I really think we can work together, and we can save this species and exploit this geothermal energy at the same time. But... The powers that be in Nevada decided, hey, you know what, nobody's, since the Navy is dropping bombs all over this and playing their war games, nobody's raising cattle or doing ag in this valley. Why don't we take the water from there and pipe it out into another valley? So they're talking about taking the groundwater out of this area. If that were to happen, I can guarantee you this toad is gone. That's going to be the end of it, because that's the only habitat that it has. Fortunately, the USGS went in there and did some studies. And what did they find? They found that, as I mentioned before, the chemistry is a little whack, man. So here's, uh, here's fluoride concentrations. And you can see every one of these hot wells exceeds the fluoride standards for maximum contamination limit. So I'm hoping that these guys will come to their senses and they'll realize, you know, if you take this water out, you're just going to be poisoning everything that you're giving it to anyway. So, But, you know, again, it's Nevada. <laughs> So, and by the way, when I go to Nevada, I get so much crap for being a Californian. So I feel, I feel fine sitting in this room saying that. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up now. And um, I think I would like to end with a conservation message. I was actually part of the CNBC Conservation Marine Biodiversity, or 
what was it, CMBC, uh, Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation at Scripps. And although I didn't really work in the marine world anymore, I took the conservation part seriously, and I think we all should. I think it's part of our duty, duties as scientists to um, try to inform conservation efforts. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, these are really distinct systems that they're often very disturbed. This is uh, one of the springs that's in Ash Meadows in 1972, okay? That's the outflow. This is alfalfa, growing alfalfa in the desert. You know, I don't think we need to do that anymore or almonds perhaps in California, but that's a whole other story. This is what it looks like after they restored it in 2004, beautiful. I mean, this is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in terms of being really beautiful habitat. Really recommend, if you ever just happen to be in Death Valley, then go to this place for sure. If you happen to be in Death Valley, you might wanna think about why you're there too. Um, so here it was in 66, before they started messing with it, and it was pretty, it was nice. This is probably Carl Hubbs who did a lot of work there, and I got a lot of crap from Scripps because it's the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and they're like, what are you doing studying fish in the desert? And I said, that's Carl Hubbs. Do you know what, you know where my office was? Hubbs Hall! <laughs> so anyway, uh, I think there's a long tradition for studying these types of systems, and there's actually a much more important story about water rights in the desert that surrounds this. If you're interested, I can give you more information about it. There were people who used to drive around in the 70s with I love pupfish, I love, and then the other ones that, I hate the pupfish, you know. So they, what happened is they were, they were um, right outside of this place, there was ag and there was also dairy farms, and they were sucking the water down, and it was gonna be gone, and then somebody stepped in, including hubs, including some other people, and they got it preserved, and it's, it's a really good story. Um, it definitely saved these guys from extinction, and as I said, I, I wanted to thank some of these other people, like Don Seda that gave me the data, this guy, David Spicer, who was really instrumental in saving the Amargosa toad. Um, and this was another one. This was Jackrabbit Spring in 1969 being sucked up again for either cattle or for, to grow something. Here's what it looks like today. So the, the message being, you can save these systems. You can restore these systems. They're actually surprisingly resilient because the chemistry never changes. The actual physical chemical properties of them never change. The habitat obviously changed, but when you reintroduce and you bring the habitat back, then the animals can survive and thrive again. This is Dave Spicer, who I just mentioned. This guy is a rancher, off-road enthusiast, miner. I mean, he does everything, okay? He had these toads living on his property. So he saw this coming down the line, and he said, these guys are gonna be a protected species for sure, and they're, they're looking like they're going extinct. So what did he do? He, instead of getting all pissed and doing anything, he started modifying all of his property and started doing all this stuff and knocking down trees and building ponds and cleaning up springs. And he brought these guys back. He and the city, including the brothel here, here's Angel's Ladies. <laughs> the whole city comes out on these surveys. And you know what they used to do is they'd all put them in a bucket. This is from this NPR story, all hopped up. Um, it's a really cool story, it's fun. And they also put them all in the bucket together. And so one of the things that we've, you know, that has come out of the work we're doing is like, don't put them all in the bucket together, man, because then they're going to spread the disease all over each other. So that's, that's why we have so many Ziploc bags in the field, because unfortunately we have to use separate bags for each animal. So some of the protocols of sampling and the protocols of how you handle these animals have fundamentally changed due to some of the data that we have, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and uh, some current projects I'm working on, as I mentioned, we just got that paper accepted. I still can't get this paper accepted, but I hope to do that when, when we get the microsatellite data. The black toads I mentioned to you, and the challenge experiments with Rana Anka. Uh, Isla San Luis is another place that's a shallow vent in the northern Gulf of California. We just got some gas data back. It's incredibly exciting. Uh, 1.32 RA, the helium stable isotope ratio is what I saw in Bahia Concepcion, which suggested a 16% mantle contribution. This island, which is the most recent volcano in the entire Gulf of California, has 7.5 RA, which means that there is a huge magmatic body sitting underneath this thing, and it's really cooking, and it could blow at any time, too. That, that volcano could erupt at any time. Uh, and now I'm actually, as, as Ivano mentioned, moving into using LIDAR to look at sea cliff erosion studies. So, you know, my, again, my message is there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of interesting things in there. Don't pigeonhole yourself, unless you really want to, then go ahead. But if you go and you just, you just let serendipity happen, it's amazing what can happen. So, and we have so many smart people around here, so many people who are experts in so many fields. Go out in the field with them, listen to them. You might, you'd just be amazed what you might find. You might find amphibians are living in hot springs and it's, it's saving them from a fungus, I don't know. You know. 
So this was the acknowledgments from my SIO stuff. I'm not going to belabor too much of that. This was my acknowledgments from my ML. ML stuff, a lot of people, a lot of people there, that's for sure. <clears throat> um, and uh, that's about it. There's a video I have at the end here of gas collection at Isla San Luis, but we're kind of running over time, um, so I'm going to let that be optional um, for anybody and take some questions. Yeah, I think I can handle it. Questions? <laughs> the host with the most. I, you know, I, I thought that was a wonderful trip through San Diego. Yeah. I, really, I really appreciate it. How did your, how did your time at Los Angeles sort of inform that uh, sort of uh, 410 trajectory? That, that is to say, that looked like a shotgun blast. 410? That's all the like. No, um, uh, they, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And, and again, it was just being in the right place at the right time with the right people, honestly. And, you know, i got to say, when, when I switched over to this thesis, Mike said, well, you know, I'm going to support you on this, but... I don't know anything about this type of stuff, so you're on your own. You're going to have to find other people to help you. Get Kenneth to help you. <laughs> and so, you know, it was great. And, you know, you, you remember, I don't know if you remember, but I didn't, I didn't know a damn thing about geochemistry. I'm not saying I'm the world's expert, but I learned a lot from doing this. And it really was, you know, as you alluded to, it was just being around the right people and doing, you know, just saying, okay, I'm open to this. You know, Are you saying geochemistry controls biology? Well, I, I have no doubt that, that geology and geochemistry control biology. I don't know if you remember, but I had a video from uh, Jorge Ledesma Vazquez, and, and uh, he was sitting on the beach one day, and I was videotaping, me, and he says, he says, oh, here we have biology modifying geology. I said, what? And I turned to Dave and I said, I said tell Gary that. And he goes, Gary, we have a problem. <laughs> So yes, there's no doubt that geology and geochemistry controls biology, but biology does a damn good job of modifying both, I think, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so first of all, did I pass? <laughs> oh, of course, thank you. Um, so you've got this, this E interaction with temperature um, providing this refugia for the toes or whatever you visual at. What about reproductive biology of those high temperatures? That's a great such, question. If, if you're left with these as being the only places that you can't be infected, um, are they able to reproduce at those levels? What are the population, I mean, are you starting to work with population biologists to look at whether or not it's just going to be a sink for those individuals that they come in and then you're toast? Or can you actually propagate the species through them? It's, it's a very good question. And as I showed you some of the evidence that they're actually leaving those systems so they're a source, are they also a sink? Potentially. In fact, that paper suggests that as well. I don't believe that because of the gradients that I showed in the system. This woman uh, that wrote that paper, she took one temperature reading at the source and extrapolated that that was the temperature all these guys are experiencing. I found plenty of infected frogs in the geothermal systems. So that would actually drive, instead of the other way, this would drive them to develop an immune response because they're constantly getting infected and constantly being able to clear themselves. The second part of your, or the first part of your question actually is the opposite. These guys can reproduce year-round because they find the ideal temperatures that you reproduce year-round. So you're seeing tadpoles in these year-round. Eggs masses year-round. All through. They all have reactions. Reaction. In fact, <laughs> some do, but that's probably not related to this at all. Um, that's probably related to trematode parasites. Not three eyes, but, but three front limbs on one And one eye on one of them. But you know, um, actually that was something that people were very concerned about. Uh, and we didn't see very much of that at all. I only saw about five or six animals that I would say were really deformed. So. Well, I'm just working, I mean, I'm thinking of the chemistry you see in the water. Sure, and it, and it does seem weird. Like I said, it took me a while to sort of wrap my head around it, but you know, they're finding that also that BD probably can be excluded by putting salt in the water, NaCl, up to 2 PPT, which the, which the frogs can survive with, and it kills off. So if you're asking, could chemistry be part of it as well, then yes, I think it could. Arsenic is actually a very effective anti antifungal, as is uh, fluoride. Fluoride is very. That's what I was going to ask you. Is that, uh, I, I looked into that a little bit, but here's the thing: those stay pretty stable throughout these systems. So if you measure fluoride at the source and you measure fluoride down below, some of it precipitates out, but it stays pretty stable. Yet I still saw a lot of disease down below. So temperature was the one factor that was really changing. So yes, we did think about it. I do think it's important. In fact, they just found recently that in uh, Yellowstone, the only place where the toads reproduce are geothermally influenced. But they're not seeing a temperature signal. They're seeing a conductivity signal. And again, it's probably protecting them from, from fungus as well. 
So is there, has anything you've learned um, been transferable to the uh, high Sierras where um, all those stoves have died off? I have suggested to those guys that they build little uh, warming stations up there and they're, <coughs> They're more open to it now than they ever were before, but um, the problem is that part of their biology requires them to be under ice for two years before they'll go through metamorphosis. So if you start tweaking that system, you're probably messing with it in a bad way as well. What I think you could do is you could get in with a little solar panel or even just some black bottom pool, and you could just set them up nearby and let little water flow into them, and then let the animals use it themselves. You don't force them to do anything. What these guys are doing in the field to try to cure them is dip them in an antifungal stuff for 15 minutes at a time. When I watched what they were doing this, and they showed me a video of it, the, the frog is trying to jump out of the thing the whole time, okay? When I watched, um, there was a fence that was built across that, that hot well spot that I showed you. When I came there at night, every night that I came there, there would be 15 frogs plastered on the fence like this. Let me in. So, I mean, I'm very convinced that they like to get warm, and they would do it if you gave them the opportunity. So yeah, we've talked about that a lot. I've gone to a lot of amphibian uh, population task force meetings, and they're, they're, they just roll their eyes when they see me now. <laughs> oh, trick pony, as far as they're concerned. <laughs> oh, it's the geothermal guy. Get out of here. <laughs>